There we go. All right. So uh, let's uh, get started. Hopefully, things are going well for you. Um, on Wednesday, we started talking about parallel architectures, right? And we went through Floyd's classification. Uh, can you help me remind me what those four classifications were? Um, it was uh, the four letters M I S I. Okay. Single structure, single structure, single data. Okay. So where does that belong? Uh, top left. Single instruction, single data. Then next one over is a. Uh, Multi instruction or multi instruction single data. Uh huh. Uh, and then bottom left is multi, uh, single instruction multiple data. Single instruction multiple data. And then multiple instruction multiple data. All right. And so these are just two dimensions by which we can parallelize our programs by either throwing more processors at the problem, that being the multiple data angle, or, um, well, we're throwing more processors at it, by, by having independent processors with the multiple um, processors right here, multiple instruction, or having them all do the, the um, same instruction right here, all right? <clears throat> so we're going to look at more detail in this quadrant today. All right, the SIMD quadrant. Okay, so in this in this scenario, we have a single instruction that's operating on multiple pieces of data concurrently. Okay, uh, and we're going to start with uh, uh, what's called a vector processor. Okay. So in math, when we talk about vectors, what are we, what are we referring to? A direction and magnitude. A direction and magnitude. That's the physical uh, interpretation of it, right? Yes. Right. Yes. So we usually have some, you know, x1, x2, x3, x4, right? Maybe more than just three-dimensional, right? Right. So we just have a series of numbers, okay? And so for a vector processor, we're going to want to be able to process these types of values. So um, the opposite of a vector value in math is a scalar value, right, which refers to a single value. And in fact, in a lot of scientific applications, uh, you will do something like um, AX plus Y where the capital letters here, X and Y, are vector values, and the, the A, the lowercase letter, is a scalar value. This is a very, very common operation. In fact, it's so common that it has its own name, okay? Um, What we'll do is we'll say what the precision of the arithmetic is. So it could be either single precision or double precision. Um, and then we just do the letters, A, X. And then for the plus sign, we'll put a P in here. And then we'll go with the Y, Sachs P or, or Dax P. Okay, you'll see this equation in a, a lot of scientific literature. They say they, they did a Sachs P or they did a, a Dax P operation. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So we want to build a processor that can do these types of operations very, very quickly. So what we're going to do is for our registers, our registers are not just going to hold one value now. Our registers are going to hold multiple values. 
So when you talk about uh, vector register, I'll just put it like this, vector register 1, if you do a vector add operation, um, I'll do it simply right here, what your, this one instruction actually encodes many uh, addition operations. Because each one of these vectors right here holds not just one data value, but multiple data values. Okay? Does what I'm saying make sense about how a vector register works? Okay? It means that all the operations that you want to do, if, if you have a processor that can do both scalar arithmetic and vector arithmetic, you have to have separate vector instructions from scalar instructions. Because the processor needs to know which set of registers to use and, um, and, and how to add, uh, locate them. It also means we probably would want to have a vector load instruction. Do our computation and have a vector store operation as well because we need to get not just one value from memory into our register but get multiple values of memory into our register. All right. Why might we build something like this? Why not just stick to a, a processor that, that each register it acts independently from each other? Any ideas? It will allow us to do um, operations that that would typically be done with vectors more efficiently. In what manner? Uh, maybe um, in like a parallel processing sort of way, perhaps? Yeah, yeah. So uh, we have freedom in how we execute these. So one way that we can speed this up is instead of having a single ALU that does this add, we can actually have multiple ALUs that are doing this ad. Uh, your authors call that idea multiple lanes. Um, it turns out that this terminology is specific to your authors. They kind of invented this terminology uh, because they were trying to come up with a terminology that would generalize across multiple architectures. They, they wanted to be able to use one term on vector processors and on SIMD processors, which we're going to look at next, and on GPU processors. And because each of those processor architectures was developed independently from each other, they all decided to use different terminology from each other. Okay, so I'm going to follow your author's lead here and use the word lanes to, to try to tie together ideas from the different architectures. Uh, but if you look in the literature, you will not find this term anywhere, unfortunately. You will find vector-specific terminology on vector architectures. You will find SIMD-specific terminology on SIMD architectures. And you will find a third terminology for GPU architectures, unfortunately. Right. So that's, that's one uh, way that we can do it. Okay. The other thing is we can apply a technique that we've, we've already accomplished e effectively with pipelining. What do we need to be true for pipelines to be um, high performance? 
for every stage of it to be full. Well, guess what? When we have vectors, we can go for long periods of time ensuring that our stages are full because we've got a bunch of pieces of data to do the operations on. Okay? And so, whereas in a processor that has to do um, many different types of operations, having a deep pipeline, so I'll even add pipeline can be deep, having a deep pipeline is uh, dangerous because we might not be able to ensure that that pipeline stays full if we have things like um, jumps and branches uh, <coughs> and other control flow interruptions. We are never, ever going to have a branch in the middle of this vector add because uh, it's defined to do all those op addition operations all at the same time. So the penalty for having a deep pipeline is going to be lessened during this vector operation right here. All right. So uh, we, we can actually do both of these here. Okay. Let me add a third benefit to uh, vector operations. Um, it enables um, future processor development without changing the ISA. Okay? So let me explain what I mean by that. That it enables future processor development without changing the ISA. Notice that nowhere in this code, pseudocode that I put on the board here, have I stated what the size of the vector is. So when processor technology today can handle a vector of one size, when the processor technology next year, or in five years, or in ten years, can support a bigger vector, I can just implement that bigger vector size. I, and I don't have to recompile my code. My code continues to work on the new processor and the old processor without any change at all, which is wonderful. Backwards compatibility is something that every architect needs to remember is um, essential. That users do not like to change. Even highly technical users have to have some incredibly compelling reason for why they're going to stop doing what they're doing to move over to some new architecture run it, maybe it's unstable, maybe the compiler isn't as good, maybe the development environment is a, isn't as good. You have to give me a really good reason to do that. And this says, well, it's better, it's better, and that's it. You don't have to do anything more. You don't have to do anything extra. Nothing new. Just take the program that you're running there, run it on this new program. Newton's new processor, which is uh, which is wonderful. Okay, so vector processor has these kind of benefits. <clears throat> Your future processor doesn't have to be bigger and faster. Your future processor could also be more energy efficient because we're going, to, um, we're going to treat this vector as a known quantity and we're going to run it in a uh, energy efficient manner in uh, something that isn't deeply pipeline because that takes up more energy with extra registers and a faster clock speed 
but we're going to um, have more simple processors that can execute these instructions. And we have less total number of instructions that we're executing for the same number of operations. So the, this is a really um, highly desirable feature to pursue. But it takes effort to build a vector processor. A vector processor is not one that many of you have probably come into contact with. For the longest period of time, most people uh, thought that vector processors were just too expensive to build for commercial uh, systems, or not commercial systems, consumer systems. Um, and so they were in the realm of Cray supercomputers were kind of the big people to, to make them popular. They, they didn't necessarily invent them, but they were the ones who made them popular. And, and, and with, with Cray supercomputers, they, they said, you know, no expense is too great of an expense to eke out an, an extra amount of efficiency or performance out of our system. So for example, when caches first started to be introduced, um, all the technologies that we talked about when we talked about the memory hierarchy were starting to be obvious even then. People knew that DRAM was going to be more compact, uh, and but it was going to be slower. And Cray said, well, why do we want slower memory? Let's pay the more expensive, but uh, less dense SRAM, because we need that performance. No cache, or maybe you think of it as 100% cache, because we're using the technology for our memory that most processors use just for the caches. If you do that, well, that changes the, the, the way that your, your memory system operates. And and there's a reason why the, the Cray was an expensive processor. Okay? So it got into people's minds that vector processors had to be expensive because their example of, an ex of a vector processor was expensive. <clears throat> um, and so the, the consumer level processors that were being developed at the same time didn't consider vector processors as being viable. Uh, and backwards compatibility is an important fact, right? There's a reason why all your desktop processors, all your laptops are x86 processors right now because of that backwards compatibility. But your phones and your tablets aren't because they didn't have that same sort of backwards compatibility that they had to worry about. So when those were f first being developed, when, when the smartphones and the tablets were coming out, it was a new pro processor platform. So they didn't have to say, oh, these, these phones or these ta tablets have to act like all these past, because there was no all these past uh, experiences. And so that's why they picked processors that were performant on an energy consumption basis. Because right? they knew that that was going to be, power was going to be an important part for a portable mobile device. And so they picked, uh, by and large, ARM processors rather than x86 processors. But now, if you were to redesign those systems, it would be a lot harder. Um, maybe it's a little bit easier for Apple because they control their entire ecosystem, but it's very difficult for an Android because it's supposed to be able to run all Android programs. And, and that regardless of its which phone it was originally developed for. All right, 
So let's talk about some of the things that a vector processor needs to do in order to enable this computation effectively. All right? So the first thing that we need to realize is that we're going to support, let's, let's do something simple. Um, let's, uh, let's do um, just an add instruction. So a sub i equals b sub i plus simple instruction here we know we're going to have this vector at right here. Okay? This is the code that the software developer is going to write. We want the compiler to generate this assembly code for the machine to execute. All right? But there's a key little problem here. N. Right? That's a program runtime variable. This could be, in fact, inside of some function where n is a parameter to that function. Because maybe it's part of a library or something like that. And so the library doesn't know what size of arrays that you're, you're adding together. All right? So the compiler needs to be able to support this code with an arbitrary size vector, but the processor has a fixed size vector. Here, right? Notice I did not put a vector length in the instruction. And that's really important. That's a big distinction between this and when we look at the um, SIMD instructions on the x86 architecture. This does not absolutely does not encode the vector size as part of the instruction and that's why it enables future processor growth. So the, the compiler needs to be able to map an arbitrary vector size to a fixed vector size. Okay? So <clears throat> there is still going to be some sort of loop. Um, branch in, involved in translating this into our uh, assembly. Because presumably the common case is that n here is larger than the vector size that the processor supports. Well, how do we do this? What's going to happen is that the processor is going to um, have a register with a fixed value. Um, we will call it um, MBL for maximum. vector length. This is going to be a register that can be accessed by the compiler. Okay? And so what the compiler can do as part of this loop is it can store um, n and it can store i and it can increment i not by 1, like in our, our loop that we wrote by hand, but we can increment our loop by the vac maximum vector length. So we say, oh, this time through this loop, we're, we know that we did 16, or 32, or 64, or however many elements are inside a vector, because we add that vector length to our counter each time through this 
loop right here. So it's like we've unrolled this loop. Remember that from ICS, unrolling loops. It's like we've automatically unrolled this loop by the size of the vector in our processor. Some vector processors will have um, will have a, an optional, not MVL, not maximum vector length, but a vector length register where the compiler can say, here is the number of elements I want you to compute inside of the vector. Okay? This can be really helpful if this value of n is not an exact multiple of the vector size. Because what you'll do is you'll iterate through here 16 elements at a time, 16 elements at a time, 16 elements at a time, if it's a 16, if the vector size is 16. Or 32 elements at a time, 32 elements at a time, 32 elements at a time, if, if the vector size is 32. But if n is some weird number like 100 or 1,000 and not you know, that same power of 2, then you're going to have this weird little offset at the very end of your loop where you have those extra amount of um, elements that you want to add, you, you want to add that aren't that exact vector multiple. The two options available to vector processors are that the compiler generates this one loop for the for the majority of the cases, and they, then they have to build a cleanup loop down here for that is uses scalar arithmetic rather than vector arithmetic for those leftover elements. Or, if the vector processor has this vector length register, you set that vector length to, its, to the maximum length on this loop except for the last iteration of the loop. And in the last iteration of the loop, you set it to the smaller leftover segment. And then you only have one loop that you have to execute through the processor right here. And it's a little bit more of a clean solution as a result. <clears throat> All right? So we have to expose a little bit of extra value. And this is going to be hard coded by the processor manufacturer. If they change the vector length in one generation of the processor from 16 to 32, this vector value is going to change from 16 on the old processor to 32 on the new processor. You don't have to do anything else. Very nice for that upgrade uh, path. <clears throat> All right. With me so far? All right. Let me slightly change what's in this loop then. I'm going to do, instead of an add instruction, I'm going to do division. Okay? No big difference. I could change this vector add to a vector div. Okay? And we're mostly good. Except, what's the problem that we might encounter with this instruction right here? Uh, divide by zero. Divide by zero is the problem. Remainder, we, we've encountered. Uh, uh, if this is most vector arithmetic, I didn't say this, but you should know this. Most vector arithmetic is floating point. So then you don't have a remainder. But the divide by zero is still a pan. So how do we take care of that? We simply put some sort of guard in here, right? If C sub i is not equal to zero. Right? 
Good, we've, we've protected our code. Except <coughs> we've completely broken our vector arithmetic. Now, because sometimes we're going to do the division in our vector, and sometimes we're not going to want to do the division in our vector, depending upon the value of the C. And so, as written right here, this is not vectorizable any longer because we don't guarantee that we can do this division operation for all elements in our register file. We can only do it for some elements in our register file. Okay? So, we need a solution to this. Okay? The solution is that we're going to have a vector mass operations. Basically, what we're going to do is we're going to have a set of bits, and the width of those bits is the size of our vector. So if our vector has 16 elements, we'll have 16 bits. If our vector is 64 elements, we'll have 64 bits, whatever the case is. And we, when we have the best vector mask operations, uh, maybe we put an M here for mask. Okay. We all of a sudden re-enable this behavior because we consult our mask first, or at the, while we're doing the division. So every one of the vector elements tries to do division, but we ignore the result if our mask is zero, and we store the result if our mask is one. So all we have to do is before this division operation, we have a, uh, a mask operation that sets the bit equal to uh, this Boolean expression for each element of our vector. So we set our vector, do the division operation. Set the vector, do the division. Some of the divisions will be protected because C sub i is zero. And, but the rest will operate exactly as expected. All right. <clears throat> this is much preferred, especially if you're talking about this exact scenario, because in this exact scenario, most of the time, C sub i should not be zero. So most of the time, we are going to do the division, and so we should be able to vectorize it, it's just we can't depend upon it being vectorized. And so the mask allows us to continue to protect the rare case where C sub i does equal zero and continue to vectorize in the common case where C sub i is not equal to zero. Right here. All right. So these mask operations are incredibly common in a vector context to be able to allow slightly more complicated codes in, in our vector. All right. All right. Let's visit this multiple lanes idea a little bit. What we're basically doing is say we have one lane. What we do then is we have uh, I'll do this. 
This is kind of what we set up. And we can make this deeply parallel to pipeline to get as many of these operations from vector V and vector W through our processor doing what we want. In a scalar processor, making, say, two lanes is a little bit complicated because when we have these two compute elements, we have to do checks that say, what if the result from here is needed at the result over here? And vice versa, what if the result from here is needed at the result over here. And so we have all this forwarding logic, we have all this hazard detection logic, we might have to put stalls in place, and so forth. But because our vector operation right here ensures that each of these operations are independent from each other, we don't have to put any of that additional logic into play when we add this new lane here. We can just put V0 and W0 here, and V1 and W1 here, and we don't even have to think about it. We don't have to worry about it because we've already ensured, by definition of the instruction, that this computation and this computation truly are independent from each other. They will never interfere with each other, and so all we have to do is add the logic to do the computation. None of the extra control logic that checks if they interfere with each other has to be added to our processor. And we can put um, V2 and W2 here, V3 and W3 here, and so on with two lanes. And if we want to, we can expand this outward as many lanes as we want. And it's all up to how much space do we have on the chip to do this extra computation and how does it weigh balancing the depth of our vector size. Obviously, we would not want to have more lanes than we have number of elements in our vector. That would just be a waste, right? And if we, we probably don't even want it to be equal, right? Because then these can't be pipelined. We might want it to be equal if we're more concerned about energy efficiency. But if we want performance throughput through our system, we might want this to be a quarter or an eighth of the size of our vector right here. All right? So whereas on our scalar processor, adding a new ALU was so complicated that we didn't really even talk about it in, in class. We just said, oh, people could do this. Here, in this scenario, it's easy enough that we'll actually say it's a benefit of this particular architecture to operate. <clears throat> Questions? Well, I've been saying wonderful things about vector architecture all day today. Maybe you should be asking your question, why aren't all processors vector architectures then? So let's, let's talk about some of the difficult things that a vector processor has to overcome in order to be able to execute properly. Uh, the first one is the vector load and vector store. We already know that our memory system is slow. And now we're going to really tax it because we're going to not just load one element for this instruction, but we're going to load multiple elements for this instruction. Likewise, we're not just going to store one element with this instruction, but we're going to store many in elements with this instruction. So you absolutely have to reconfigure your memory system 
to be able to support these vectorized memory operations. You can't do something like this. Where you have your processor here and a single thin uh, configuration to your memory subsystem. You're, you're, this is going to be the bottleneck. You're not going to get enough memory through. So instead, what you're going to have to do is maybe something. like this. I'm not emphasizing this so much. Maybe it's not a shared communication mechanism. Maybe it is. But what's really important is that you've got multiple physical chunks of memory that you access can access concurrently. So while you issue your first vector request to this memory bank, you can simultaneously issue your first memory request to bank 1 and to bank 2 and to bank three. And what you will do, and, and this will completely depend upon the technology that you're using for your memory system, is you'll make sure that you can issue enough requests to enough banks here so that by the time uh, you get the value back from one, zero, then one, then two, then three, and, and you're done with the banks, when you come back to bank number zero, it's ready to give you the next memory request. So that you can stream your data as if it just is nonstop. Just like we need this to be pipelined and deep, and we have all the operations coming through our processor and, and ready to go and ready to run, we need all the data coming from our memory system to be nonstop and contiguous through our processor so that we are not blocked waiting for some memory request to return that value to us. So you need to make sure that you configure your memory system to be able to handle that kind of mechanism. That's relatively easy if the vectors in memory are contiguous. So, array element 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, okay? Where that gets difficult is if our memory elements are not contiguous, okay? And you might say, well, why would you ever have it not contiguous? Okay, and the answer, the, the easy answer, not the glib answer, but the easy answer, is matrices. Okay, if you do something simple like a matrix matrix multiply, right, where you are taking this matrix and you're multiplying it by this matrix. Super common operation in a, any sort of scientific, scientific application. What are you going to do? You're going to traverse this matrix by column, you're going to traverse this matrix by row. And so you're going to want one vector to represent this column. You're going to want another vector to represent this row. And I don't care how you support matrices, if you do it C style or you do it Fortran style, one of these two values is not going to be contiguous in memory. Because this is going to be next to these, and this is going to be separated by however many elements in your row. Or vice versa with these right here. Okay. 
this is so common that now this and this and this and this and this are not stored contiguous. And so if you do a um, what's called a strided load, where now your axis, when you're doing your um, vector load, you're going to, we'll add a little prefix here for strided, which just means that we're going to expect these elements to be a certain distance apart. And that will be specified in here what, what that distance is. <clears throat> now, all of a sudden, all the hard work that you put into building this memory system that can handle contiguous memory elements to feed that memory smoothly to your processor so that it could get those values in your pipeline has been defeated potentially by the memory layout of your matrix. Okay? Does that make sense? All right. Let me throw a different wrinkle uh, to just show that it's, it's not easy. Turns out that for a lot of scientific applications, there are in these matrices or in these vectors, there are a ton of zeros in this matrix here. And then there are just a very few number of non-zeros. Okay? We call this a sparse matrix. The sparsity being the number of non-zeros. The size of this matrix is so large that it is not worth storing all the zero values in the matrix. Instead, what you're going to do is you're going to store some representation of this matrix that is um, more compact. So you might say, oh, I've got one located here, I've got another located here, a third here, and a fourth here. Even if you give, this is not how they do it, but even if you give the x, y coordinates of these values, you've still saved a lot of storage space here if it's sparse enough. Okay? <clears throat> so, um, the representation of this sparse matrix now uh, makes it harder, even harder than the previous example I gave, because at least in the previous example I gave, it was regular. Every 100 elements, or every 1,000 elements is going to be the next one I want. There is no regularity in here. So how do I find the next one, and how do I do that computation with another um, one? And so, the mechanism for supporting this, we're out of time, um, is very complicated. It's called gather-scatter gather, operations. Are necessary to be able to support these. These are so common that the vector processor needs to be able to support them and has built-in instructions to be able to support these kind of sparse data structures efficiently. But it's a lot of extra work and it's not easy to do. And you're not going to encounter these on a consumer level processor. Again, it's only on these big supercomputing um, expensive processors that it's going to be worth adding this complicated instruction into your instruction set architecture because it's going to be used frequently in that use case but it's not going to be used frequently in my daily emails or browsing the web or Photoshop or whatever, whatever 
I'm, I'm normally doing to interact with the processor. But it is going to be an essential component of simulating the universe, or folding proteins, or understanding how atoms interact with, with each other at the subatomic level, or what, whatever kind of simulation you're doing um, with, with physics. And so those processors absolutely need this. Okay. So this is a quick one-day overview of vector architectures. Next week, we will pick up and compare this to how the processors that you use on an everyday basis try to take advantage of SIMD operations. Have a great weekend, everyone. I'll see you on Monday. Thank you.